Open your Bibles to 1 Kings 19. We're in a series on the life of Elijah and a specific period of his life ministry. And that is during the reign of King Ahab, which was the eighth king of the North Kingdom. And this is a, a really important part to his life. for the great opportunity God gave him to put a nation back on its feet of faith. Ahab had married a, a Jezebel who was named after the gods of the Baal worship. Her father was a priest king of Sidon. She was of noble birth, and apparently that was a political marriage. The problem with that marriage of a foreign wife is that she brought all of her religion with her. Uh, pagan religion of Baal worship. Baal worship goes all the way back to the children of Israel entering the promised land and, have, and having to contend with them. Uh, they are, they have, their major headquarters is now in Sidon during the time of Elijah. That would be more their Mecca capital of their worship. And when she married into the kingdom, into the Israel. She brought 850 prophets with her. Uh, half of them were male and half of them were female. Half of them uh, represented the male structure of the religion of, of Baal. And the other uh, represented the female section of it, uh, Ashrathah. And uh, that's where Israel got involved with uh, temple prostitutions, uh, demonic sex. And uh, they were still contending with it in 1 Corinthians. I think about that. The book of Corinthians talks about it. And um, still warning is still warning the world about it. Satan had a hold of something when he combined asceticism and lasciviousness into one religion. We met another female of that religion of the female section of the worship of Baal uh, when we met the widow of Zarephath. I said there are two women from Sidon, both involved in the religion of Baal that were important in Elijah's life. And these two women, uh, one he was able to convert and the other uh, drove him to a place in his life where he, com he, he considered suicide. In our study today, we'll become aware of that. And so here we are, I don't know, maybe 18 lessons, something like that, deep into the study on this specific. I chose this because there's such a parallel to our nation. Uh, God trying to bring a spiritual awakening in Israel sent them three and a half years of drought by the prayer of the national prophet Elijah. He brought him to the highlight, spotlight. He prayed this prayer and put him under three and a half years. James talks about it. The widow, the widow of Zarephath talks about this man of prayer and the word. 
He said, she said, that his mouth speaks such words of wisdom and truth. <clears throat> he was a man of prayer and a man of truth when we meet him and he becomes <clears throat> uh, a John the Baptist. For all practical purposes, John's ministry reflected Elijah's ministry <clears throat> in regard to the national status. And because of that comparison, I chose to talk about Elijah during the time of our crisis of the COVID. I think there is a strong parallel here, a strong parallel for the church. <clears throat> the world, of course, is asleep. They're dead. They're spiritually dead. And of course, they're spiritually asleep. They have no eyes to see. If they had them open, they couldn't see. The natural man can't, can't, can't understand the things of God. He has to be born again. The Spirit of God has to become part of his life that teaches him the truth of God's word. The world doesn't have a clue how to uh, fix your problems. If you go to the world to solve a problem that has a spiritual connotation, it only gets worse. Elijah will show you that today. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're, we've picked up Elijah uh, a short brief period where there are three and a half years of drought and God has faithfully taken care of him at the brook and then at the, the widow of Zarephath logistically, logistical grace. My God shall supply all your needs according to the riches of his graces in Christ. You know that Philippians 419. He, he is living that experience. By the way, so are you and I. No less and no more, but the same. The same logistical grace that took care of him is taking care of us. <clears throat> and um, times got a little tough, but God, God, God marvelously uh, took care of him, didn't he? When he was at the brook, he sent ravens to feed him from the king's table. <laughs> okay. That's before ships came out. You could order your food. For that. So it's just a it's just a wonderful character, and I think there's a parallel for us. And so I want to go back to the 19th chapter and look at three through eight again. I, I need to do another study with you from that passage. <clears throat> They've come off, he's come off from Mark Carmel with two great victories. You remember the two great victories? Brought fire from heaven and won the contest at Mark Mount uh, Carmel because the, the prophets of Baal couldn't do it. <clears throat> they, they, all day, all night, uh, they shed their blood on the altar, which doesn't work for your salvation. Your blood doesn't count. It's the blood of Christ that counts. And so when the blood of Christ in shadow Christology was put on the cross, was put on the altar, God put, lit it up and burned it and showed that he's still on the throne. He may not be on the throne in Israel, but he's on the throne of Israel. And uh, it's true for us today. You know, we, we have a great opportunity to vote, and you should. Because, because we have the right to vote, you should vote. What kind of a Christian doesn't vote? We, we live in a wonderful nation that gives the citizenry the opportunity to vote <clears throat> and your vote counts it counts with the lord as much as your prayer you pray for the nation you have this wonderful opportunity to vote vote your conviction vote where you think the nation is vote you should pray about it and go vote you should encourage your neighbors to vote who they vote for is their business, but voting is our business. <clears throat> and so we, uh, most nations don't have this privilege. Nowhere near. I mean, we, our constitution really does believe that it's the government is we the people. I think we the people have forgotten this. We're so dependent on the government for everything 
that we should depend on God for. I, well, he said this, the second great victory, of course, was the rain coming off the Mediterranean Sea that said that their drought was over, that God was content that there was a spiritual awakening in Israel. He had made this great victory. All of the, listen, all of the national, a lot of people don't know who, who was at Mount Carmel. All the national leaders. It wasn't open to the public. It was open to the 12 tribes. But they brought all of the national leaders in. That's Obadiah's great contribution. He was connected to the people. And he brought them all. They were all there. You know, Jezebel wasn't. You know why she wasn't there? She has no clout in the government. She's married to the king. That's it. Elijah's given her way too much clout for what she actually had. She had none. She had enough with the king that she was able to kill a hundred, uh, most of the prophets except for a hundred of Israel. But that's because she slept with them. She had sleeping power. She didn't have authority. She had none. And that's important to our, our, our story because when he gets back to Jezreel, which was their summer palace, and she discovers from King Ahab that by Elijah's encouragement and command, uh, the, the Israelites killed all of her prophets. <clears throat> and she, she writes a message to Ahab and says, within 24 hours, you're going to be like my prophets. <clears throat> and what's he do? Here's verse 3. Here's what he does to an empty threat. She, this woman has no power over his life. It, can I tell you something else? The one who did have power over his life <clears throat> was the king, and he doesn't have any power over his life. Only God has power over the life of a believer. Don't ever, don't ever let any. <clears throat> disease don't have power over your life. <clears throat> Nor do people. But God Almighty does. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty has power over your life and has authority over it, and you should be thankful for that. He is not. He is not, but he should have been. Here's verse 3. As a result of the threat, he was afraid he, he, and arose and ran for his life. Now, what he, when he, like so many believers, when it says he ran for his life, he ran from the source of his life. The source of his, of his life is God Almighty, who sent his son to die on the cross. Shadow Christology in the Old Testament. Historical Christology in the New Testament. And he got saved the same way you did, except with a prophetic gospel. Uh -huh. Galatians 3.8. You, you ought to get that verse down. That's how people got saved in the Old Testament. Just like you, but with a prophetic gospel. Christ one day would come. He would die on a cross. Visual aid, animal sacrifice. The Lamb of God has come to take away the sin of the world. He's going to be buried on third day, raised from the dead. Oh, happy days. That was before the movie. He was afraid and he rose and he ran for his life away from God. Away from God. Jezebel don't have any authority over his life. He's running from God. He, came, he comes to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. Then he left his servant there. Remember that. That's a key. He left his servant there. Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He himself, or he alone, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. Actually, it wasn't a tree. It's not even in the Hebrew tree. It was a bush, a large bush, by the way. They could be small or they could get large, just depend on the weather. One thing for sure, they can survive a drought. They're a wilderness bush. 
Well, he goes a day's journey into the wilderness. He ought to be safe there. And he came and he sat down under a juniper tree. And he made a prayer request for himself that he might die. He said, it is enough. In other words, here's what he said. I've had enough. You know what we call that? We call that burnout. <laughs> burnout. I'm hanging up my sword. I've had it. I've had enough. I'm done. Let me tell you, those are the saddest words that could ever flow from your mouth. Those are the saddest words that could ever flow from your life, mouth. Listen, it ain't over until God says it's over. It ain't over until God says it's over. It's not over when you say it's over. You don't get the right to quit. It's a privilege to go on. You don't have a right to quit. God didn't save you to quit. You'll know when it's time, just like Elijah will. If he has to come and get you, he'll come and get you with uh, quite a hearse. And it was quite a hearse that, got, that picked up Elijah. Well, he says, it's, uh, it's enough now, O Lord. I've, I've had enough. Time for me to hang it up. And here's what he said, O Lord, take my life. You know when he says it's enough, it means he's, he, he, he's ready to die. Now, that's a dumb prayer. That is a dumb prayer. You know why? Because of Ecclesiastes 3rd chapter 1 through 8, that's a dumb prayer. If you pray that prayer, it shows you how depressed you are. You need to go get some help. That's not speak, speaking out of spiritual, uh, uh, out of spiritual strength. That's speaking out of human weakness. I tell you, when your life gets that place, you need a good dose of God. And listen, what a cowardly prayer! Is he thinking suicide? Listen, is he thinking suicide? Of course he is. My life is on. What's wrong with my life? My life is on. Of course he is. But he wants God to do it. You don't have to tell God to take your life. He's already got it. Look, at the, look what he's doing. He's running for his life, and then he tells God to take it. He should have told God to take it before he started running. He don't mean God take it. He means I'm a coward. Take my life. I don't want to serve you anymore. I'm through serving you, God. I'm through serving you. Look what I get from serving you. That's, that's his attitude. You do know that, don't you? If I had prayer, I could feel my engine starting. Where am I reading? It's enough. So he lays down and he sleeps under a juniper tree. And behold, a teaching angel nudges him. And he says, get up and eat. You know what that means? Live, not die, you dummy. Get up and live, not die. This is not your death day. This is your living day. Still got, you still got air in your lungs? That's Nisha Mahaim. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. That's life. You got breath in your lungs? That's life, and God has a plan, and you're in it. Get up and eat, and get about the Lord's work. Sit around and moan and groan, fuss, all depressed. Where does that get you? It gets you all depressed. I want to quit. He wants to quit on the job, man. 
we ain't even got started. He's wanting to quit. We ain't even got started. The whole idea of a spiritual awakening was to have a spiritual reformation. We ain't even got it. He's on the run. 24 hours after great victory, this guy's on a run for his life and sick to death and telling God, I'm, I'm quitting. Took off his shoes, laid down his sword, crawled up in a fetal position and asked God to kill him because he didn't have the courage to fight and die. What a coward. He's not a coward, but he's turned into one. Jezebel has got him on the run. All she did was send a message without any authority behind it. Jeez. So he lay down and slept. What a lot of people think they do in a fetal position, maybe tomorrow will wake up and I just lived a dream. Tomorrow. Except he don't, he's not even thinking of tomorrow, is he? He wants to crawl, he wants to go into a fetal position and have what happen. What was his prayer? Lord, take my life. Like, I don't want your life now. He'll take it when it's ready to be taken. A teaching angel arise and eat, and he looked, and behold, there was at his head a, a bread cake, bread cake baked on hot, sto on hot stones. Isn't logistical gray something? This guy needs to, this guy needs a whipping. He should have took one of those little branches off <laughs> that bush and spanked him while he was asleep. But he gives him a, a gentle nudge and says, get up and live. And when he wakes up, there, there is manna from heaven, uh, angel food bread, angel food cake, and some water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. <laughs> The angel came a second time, did the same stuff, and said, arise and eat. Because your journey, <laughs> your journey is too great for you in the state you're in. You love that. One day after a great victory, he's in a fetal position asking God to take his life. And God has a plan. God has a plan that's so much greater then his heart could even imagine God has a plan for his life. That an involvement in the great plan of God, he's got a place for Elijah, a key, a key role. And Elijah's in a fetal position under the juniper tree, asleep, hoping that when he wakes up, he'll be in heaven. <laughs> well, let's have prayer and let me get preaching. I've meddled, haven't I? Let me preach. Well, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude types, sins of the tongue or overt sins. It could be sins like Elijah, depressed with the work of God, despondent to the work of God, fed up with the work of God, fed up with the life of God. Crawls up in a fetal position and wants God to take their life. Thinks death would be better than serving God on the earth. Let me tell you, there's nothing better than serving God on earth in the plan of God. Well, Father, we're thankful today. We, we understand how to get out of carnality and back into spirituality in this church, but for those who are attending by internet, we remind them carnality and evidence of it is personal sin. We confess that sin according to 1 John 1, 9. The work of Christ on the cross is extended to the Christian life in cleansing us to restore us from personal sin into spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at a few points today. I entitled Sleeping Under a Juniper Tree. The first thing I need to do is tell you a few things about a juniper tree. It is a wilderness plant. It's not a tree. It's actually a bush. Some get at, at pretty good size, but it's still considered a desert bush. 
it would have offered more of a shadow than shade. W wasn't a lot to that bush. You might have been able to move with the sun moving, keep moving around to a side <laughs> uh, where you're out of the sun, but you would have had to have done that. You couldn't have just, it wasn't a great big tree leafed over like you might imagine with a lot of shade. Uh, you could have put a hammock or something. It wasn't that type at all. However, it was a very famous uh, desert plant. The juniper tree roots, for example, were used as a, as a wilderness survival food. Uh, Job uh, 30, verse 4. The roots and the sticks that came from it, the small sticks that came from that, were used for night fire, for warmth, and to keep de desert predators away from you. Psalms 120, verse 4. It wasn't much. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. When you're in the desert and there is nothing, even a little bush is company. Remember, listen to me now, he doesn't need to be where he is. Now, I say that to you because there's always the geographical will of God that's connected to the operational will of God, that's connected to the mental will of God, that is, that is part of the directive will of God. When you're where you ought to be, that's a big deal. When you are where you ought to be and you know that, that's a big deal. It's a lot bigger than you take it for granted. It's a lot bigger than you might think. For example, your presence here today. He doesn't have to be in the desert. That's not where God sent him. He sent him to the city to have a, a reformation, right? He's in a desert. There's nothing. I mean, who are you going to get in the desert to be part of this great reformation? No one. No one. Even John the Baptist had to leave the wilderness to have a great revival, to have a great reformational movement. In other words, to announce the coming of the Messiah. You remember, he, he was dressed like a wilderness uh, guy, a desert guy, wasn't he? His mannerisms and everything. This is Elijah. I mean, yes, he's more comfortable. Where did he run? He ran to his home. I mean, he was comfortable in the wilderness. He was uncomfortable in the city. And when he got tired of serving God in the city and he got ready to quit and retire, he went to the wilderness where he's more comfortable. Except he went into a fetal position. That's not good. Well, remember, he doesn't have to be where he is. He is where he is because of a series of wrong choices, because he's running from God rather than towards him. Here is a key. Elijah is not running with endurance the race that's been set before him. He knows the race that's been set before him. He knew that when he left Mount Carmel. The spiritual reformation, you're to lead a spiritual uh, reformation. He had... He had, Eli God had Elijah, he needed three guys. He had Elijah, he had Obadiah, and he's working on the king. He's working on a king. And Elijah is supposed to be out there telling the people what God is telling him. Elijah's not running with endurance, the race set before him, like we're asked to do. Don't be sitting under a tree when you ought to be out there running a race, and you ought to be running it with endurance because it's the race that God set before you. It may not be the race you chose, but it's the race that's been chosen for you, and you need to be very much aware of that. I had a long nights, a lot of long nights, talking to my wife about this very thing. The race that God had set before, she must run to the end. She... The, the win is finishing.
finish it. You've got to know the race that God has set before you. You've got to know that race, and you've got to be honorable with it. You've got to run it. You can't quit. You have to run it to the goal line. Set your eyes. See, you need to read Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. I read that over and over to my wife. As she ran the race set before her. Not to quit. To stay actively engaged in the race. How do you run it? With what? Endurance. And it tells you where your endurance comes from if you'll read Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It will tell you your prototype, who your model is for that. You should pay attention to that. Well, here we have Elijah under a juniper tree in a fetal position. And God, listen, here's the marvelous thing. God's still providing logistical grace. Now, he's really out in the Tule, Tules. He's in the wilderness, which is his comfort place. But he's in a fetal position, right? He's in a fetal position under the juniper bush. Even God in his grace gave, let him get to a bush. <laughs> and then took care of him the most marvelous. He took care of him just like he did the children of Israel in the wilderness. He served him. He served him food from heaven. He served him food. From, he sent a, an angel down that cooked him breakfast. Gave him some manna bread from heaven, some angel food cake. Strawberries and whipped cream, I'm hoping. That make my day. And here's Elijah's attitude. I've had enough. I'm sick and tired of the ministry. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm quitting. Elijah, it hasn't even started. <laughs> Elijah's quitting, and he hasn't even started. His start is now, let's get a reformation. Let's do this spiritual reformation. My, my, my. God will show you when enough's enough. He did with Job, he did with Jonah, and he has with Elijah. If you need more examples, just read on in the Bible. Listen, for sure you don't tell God when enough's enough. <laughs> you know what 2 Corinthians 12, 9 tells you? You never have to say that to God because God's already said it to you in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Do you know that? My goodness, you ought to know that. You can learn this easy or hard. Huh? God's grace is what? You know what that is? Enough. It's always enough. It's always enough. And you know what's interesting? God gave him angel food cake and a drink. And then he said, that'll last you. You've got a 40-day journey ahead of you. You got to, he's only gone one day into the wilderness and he's in a fetal position. He's told to get up and eat. Listen, he had, listen, when he went to the wilderness, he had nothing but God. He had nothing. This man didn't take one, he didn't take a bottle. A desert, a guy going to the desert ought to know you got to have a bottle of water. but he's running for his life. He doesn't care. I didn't take anything because I'm just going to crawl up and die. I don't need anything for where I'm going. He didn't take anything. You don't know where you're going. What do you mean you're going? You don't know where you're going. Listen, when he went into a fetal position, God still had a 40-day program for him. Think that the next time you lay down. God's got a 40-day program for you. And the journey's too great, so I'm going to feed you. What you got? I got an angel food cake in the last 40 days. When in my house, angel food cake don't last but about half a day, but 
especially if there's strawberries and whipped cream. Here's a doctrinal principle. The spiritually mature believer cannot sleep away his spiritual problems. In psychology, we call that avoid, avoidance and denial. And those are bugger boos. That, you go to a psychologist, he uses those words, it's going to cost you some money. <laughs> those are money words. Eh, you're just, you're in, you're in repression and suppression and avoidance and denial. And boy, you get your checkbook out because he's going to talk to you. The spiritual mature believer cannot sleep away his spiritual problems by avoidance or denial. He must face the reality no matter how complicated you think they have become in your life. I, that, that's called counseling. Oh, my life. Oh, my God. I got this. I got that. I don't know what to do. And I'm just pulling out my hair. You don't listen. You're bald already. Don't pull more. And you have a problem there. Whoa, look, I, I know I was got crazy. I pulled all my hair out. Can you help me get my hair grow back? You just create so many problems when you don't pay attention to what God's doing with your life today. He's got tomorrow. Listen, tomorrow's not the issue. Yesterday's gone. Forget it. Forget it. Today's the day. Even when you talk about salvation, God says, today's the day. Behold, today's the day of salvation. Every day is. Once you get born again, every day is the day where salvation is an issue. Not to get it, to live it. My, my, my. You must stop wallowing in a self-induced misery called pity and stop being preoccupied with self-importance, running for his life, and consider where it's got you, thinking suicide in a fetal position under a juniper bush. Point number, I don't know where I am. I think I just blew through one and two. Let me just say this. He went from flames. He went from fame to flame. Fames. Fame to flames in 24 hours. Think about that. Just in case, you know, you've come out of this great spiritual victory in your life. What can you, what can you expect? A counterattack, a major counterattack by Satan. He's running, he's, he, he's running reconnaissance on you, too. He's going to get you in the area he thinks he can get you. He's running reconnaissance on you. Listen, he, listen, he, he, he knew he was going to get whipped at Mount Carmel. He started his strategy after that. He knows, those, he knows there's no gods of Baal. They're all demons set up by him. So what's he doing? He's strategizing. He's playing defense. He's strategizing at, on defense on Mount Carmel. He's strategizing offense off Carmel. Oh, please pay attention. My, my, my. Mm. Don't let him get your number because he's got your number. Don't let him use it against you. He you got your number. He's got all of our numbers. Your life is never better without God in control of it. Your life is never better. Without God in control of it. The spiritual advancement believer is better on his feet. On offense than on his back. Defense and retreat. Yet, he is better on his back alive than on a cold slab dead. Right? Nisha Mahaim, as long as you got that breath of God in you, inhale, exhale. Get back into plan. You must stop wallowing in defeat. Point number three. Suicide is no option for the believer. Suicide is no option for a believer. And certainly, it's not for an unbeliever. My goodness, can you imagine 
the devil tricking an unbeliever into taking his own life so he can go to hell? My goodness, I hope you're not that stupid. That's as dumb as a brick. Listen, you're born in Adam's sin headed to hell. The only way is to stop and believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. The only way you can get off that choo-choo train headed to hell through Adam's sin is to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the devil can trick you, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and blind your mind to the truth of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he, you will send yourself to hell. How terrible is that? That's as dumb as a brick. Judas Iscariot, he got him to kill himself. Think about that. Made his own noose, did the whole deal. What a sad day. What a sad day is when a person sends their own soul to hell in suicide. For an unbeliever, that's unacceptable. And for a believer, it's unnecessary. Get out of your fetal position. Stand on your feet and, and fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith, not failure. No great fight and failure. My, my. Well, you can read about Judas Iscariot and his deal in Matthew 27, 1 through 8, and Acts. That's Acts 1, 15 through 21. Even as a spiritual mature believer, Elijah knew that suicide was wrong and reworded his prayer of death. He, he reworded. He understands he got to pray according to the will of God. So he changes, he reworded. Now, in his heart, he's thinking suicide. But he knows that don't go over with God because he, he's got doctrine. So what's he do? He rewords his prayer. Take my life, Lord. Listen. That's just, listen, that's a given. The Lord's got your life. He's got you. you you're, John, the 10th chapter, 28 through 30, your life is in the hands of Jesus, which is in the hands of God. No one can get you out of God's hands. Jeez. Not even suicide. God has to sign off on it. Not even suicide. And so he rewords his prayer, Lord, take my life. Notice that Elijah's prayer under the juniper tree was outside the will of God. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, don't pray outside the will of God. It's not going to get answered. He can't, suicide's no answer. What's his problem? He's running from God. Suicide's not the answer. You want God? Well, I want to die and be with God. Listen, how about live and be with God? That's God's plan. God's plan is for you to live in him and get the job done that he's called you to do. You quit. People all the time, please stop asking me when I'm going to retire. It won't be in a fetal position under a juniper bush asking God to take my life. When I know there's 40 more days. There's always 40 more days. That's a pretty long time. Oh, you know what they run the marathon, do 40 days. Well, skip the 26 miles. Just skip it and go for 40 days. See how that works. <laughs> he told him, he said, listen, you've quit after one day on the job. You quit after one day on the job. I got 40 more days lined up. You got to get your act together, Bubba which is my act, by the way, Bubba. Note the content of his prayer once he took over his life choices. By that, I mean without consulting God. It's got him nowhere. He's under a bush. He ought to be rallying the troops. 
he should be leading a great reformation. Let me give you some doctrinal principles. Here's the first one. You cannot fool God. He knows your heart. You can't fool God. All these words, like he, th he thinks he's really tricky with his rewording. <laughs> like God don't know his heart. I'm quitting. I'm out of now. I was sad. Uh, man knows your heart, man. Listen, there, your wife don't know your heart. Your wife don't have a clue. She thinks she does. She don't know your heart of hearts. Listen, you husbands don't know their heart of hearts either. Their heart of hearts. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, for both of you, who does know it is God. You need to come clean with him. Don't be running those thoughts think nobody hears them because God hears them and he wants to clean them up. You can't run anything. You can't run anything through your head. Well, nobody knows what I'm thinking. Oh, yeah, God does. I, uh... You can have fool God. He knows your heart and he knows his plans for you even if you don't know them at the time. Ecclesiastes 1 through 3, every activity of life, which is called under the heavens, has all been mapped out and planned. Isn't that something? See, I'm excited. I'm excited for what's ahead. I don't dwell on what was yesterday, and I don't dwell on much on, on what today is. I live the tomorrows. I'm excited about what God has for me tomorrow. Because all my tomorrows is in his hands. Listen, I know that more today than I ever have in my life because of my age. And I'm excited. I'm excited about it. Here's another principle. A day under the juniper tree may get worse before it gets better. You think, well, I don't know how it could get any worse. Well, the worst would be if he committed, actually committed suicide, wouldn't it? How terrible would that fall on his own sword? Would be terrible. A day under the juniper tree... Could get worse before it gets better. Could get worse. But it won't get better until you confess your sin and return to God in faith. That's for sure. It's all, unless if you're under a junior, junior for tree, it's okay. It's not okay to stay. And it's not okay to get it, be in a fetal position and pray the pray, pray, prayers you're praying. That's not okay. But what is okay is to confess your sins, get back on your feet, and live your life of faith. Because there is tomorrow, and tomorrow is a long journey. And that ought to be exciting. And it is if you put your heart with God. What God has in store for you tomorrow is so much more exciting than it is today and it was yesterday. You know, when I read 2 Corinthians 11 and I see Paul's journeys, you would think, why would he ever, why would he ever want to go on another journey? You ought to read that list of what it means to be really engaged in ministry. And after about three or four of those, we'd have probably closed the book with Elijah and said, I'm quitting, man. I can't take any of this, more of this. I mean, Wow. So what was, what was the purpose? Well, the purpose was every day getting up, getting your Bible and going out and preaching the word of God and teaching and seeing people's life change. That's where the excitement was of Paul. It wasn't being shipwrecked three days and three nights on an island with people who, if you close your eyes, they'll eat you. But see, life's changed. The excitement of, of seeing God do miraculous things, being able to get up and be part of Mark Carmel every day. Uh, that's, that's what it is for me, anyhow. 
third doctrinal principle, after confession of sin and mental attitude adjustments to the directive will of God, things can get better rather than worse. <laughs> That's the story of Elijah. He actually is going to take the advice of a teaching angel. He's actually going to get up and eat, and he's going to go on a 40-day journey with God. That's going to turn into a lot more days than that. This was true for Elijah while still under the juniper tree by a visit from a teaching angel who awoke him out of a spiritual slumber and touched him to awaken to the things of God. I hope that could happen to you today. Notice the first thing that the teaching angel, angel told Elijah, arise and eat. In other words, live, not die, is God's plan for you. Live and not die. When death finally comes to Elijah, it will be spectacular. <laughs> it won't be in no fetal position. It will be read to children in Sunday schools in the Christian church forever. Elijah in the whirlwind. My, my, those little kids love that story. Note where the te te watch this. Note where the teaching angel pla placed Elijah's logistical grace food and drink. Yeah? Did you see that? That yeah, could be a gate question. At his head. All the senses, the smell, the taste, memory. Think what all comes in the morning. For example, when you awake, you smell your favorite foods cooking. Somebody's got up ahead of you. Got the fire stoked and going. And I was a little kid, slept upstairs in the farmhouse. Well, when it started, the heat started getting up there and getting a little warmer. Well, ooh, somebody, grandpa's gotten up and stoked the fire. Then I could smell bacon cooking, eggs. Oh, that'd get you out of bed. When I, in my life today, when I, I can, memory works off in those smells. My memory works off those smells. I can, I just did it. I just think as a small child, I, it takes me back to a wonderful place in my soul. Placed him at his head. You know, what was he trying to tell Elijah? It was a message for Elijah to get his head back into the plan of God. There is still work to be done. There's divine production. You're still alive. The plan of God is still active. Get involved in it. You have been spiritually asleep. It's time to awaken and get busy doing the revealed will of God. Stop wasting time complaining and spiritually sleeping. There's a message for the church. After one day of running away from God, Elijah has convinced himself to quit. But God has another assignment, a 40-day race set before him of the Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, which is described in 1 Kings 19, seven and following. The spiritually advancing believer needs to be where God wants him to be in the directive will of God. We call it the geographical. He's, he's got him headed towards uh, Mount Horeb. It's going to take him 40 days to get there. He's got, in other words, he gets it. Get up and live. You got a 40 days journey. Get back into the plan of God. Get your head back in the game. Got a game to win, Bubba. Let's get, in to get, let's get in it. And so he talks about the geographics. We're going to Mount Horeb. Mentally, new assignment, directive will of God. Operational, you got to get there by walking by faith. I'm not asking you to walk 40 days in your own strength. You ain't got enough. You're in a fetal position under a bush. You wouldn't think I would even call you, but I want you. I haven't trained you all these years for naught. I want you to get up. I want you to eat a healthy breakfast. It's going to take you 40 days on a new assignment. 
my, 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 ain't God wonderful? Is not God wonderful? How is he going to walk that journey? You're going to walk it by faith. You're going to walk it by faith. So when you get there, you're going to be able to do the job I've sent you to do. The juniper tree was not the place to find comfort to the weary warrior of God. The juniper tree was never designed to replace the great inner comfort that only God can give to the believer into the human heart. John 14. If you want something different in your life, then you must choose something different for your life. The world cannot do it. The world can make exchanges within the lust pattern of the human being. One example would be a, be a believer can embody lust. He might have a lung problem or something, a difficulty, and so he gives up smoking. But what does he usually turn to? Food. And that now he has a what? A weight problem. He gave up a smoking problem or a weight problem? Why? Because he doesn't know how to conquer the lust pattern of the sin nature. Doesn't know how to walk in the spirit. Doesn't know how to walk by faith. The way, that's the way the world teaches you. That's the world. They just move you from one problem to another problem to another problem to another problem until you're ready to quit it all and get, hang it all up. There's no solution in that. No solution. The power of the Holy Spirit in you, the power of the Word of God in you, they're both walks. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk by faith. This moves you forward in the plan of God. Let us pray. Asleep under the juniper tree, Father, we don't need to be asleep under the juniper bush. Not in a fetal position. This weary warrior has wimped out by all choices he's made. He's bought into the despair and the futility of his life. How was that possible? He just came off from one of the great victories at Mount Carmel. And what is God doing with this man? He's trying to clean out old man thinking and replace it with new man thinking. How is this man in one day after Mount Carmel in a fetal position asking for God to take his life? Where did that thinking come from? It came from where it's always been in his heart and hasn't been removed. This 40-day journey is going to be a journey of taking off the old man and putting on the new man. There's work to be done. He can't do it in the old man. The old man has got to go. It don't even know how to celebrate victory. The old man, you, it doesn't even celebrate victory. One day later, is in a fetal position wanting to die. That man has got to remain asleep. And the other man that got up and is ready to take a 40-day journey that man has got to fight the fight of good faith. Over 40 days, he'll have to learn that. He'll have to deal with that. So that when he gets to the next assignment, he can be prepared to stand and fight the good fight of faith for God. Father, if that's true in our life today, Let's get it out. Let's be done with that old man. Let's live the new man in the dynamics of the plan of God. Every day, fresh and new, exciting, renewed in my soul. The youthful man, the new man, refueled and energized by the word of God and the power of the spirit to do the things of God. May we be those people, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.